Uh, thank you everyone for coming out today for this lunchtime talk. Um, I'm about, I think I'm supposed to be about halfway through a major research project, so I've tried to give you a taster today. It's been uh, generously funded by the Lever Human Trust, um, the British Academy, and I've also had support from, from All Souls College in Oxford uh, to help um, to give you a home base while I've been doing research in the archives. I'm working on an academic book and various publications like that, but there will also be um, public events like this one and an exhibition um, about the photography that, that will open in Lincoln next year, and I hope we'll, we'll tour from there. So you're getting a preview. I could talk for hours about this, but don't worry, I won't. Um, <laughs> we've got to finish within an hour, so I'm going to try to talk for about 45 minutes, and then I'm happy to take questions at the end. And yeah, I hope that will uh, be interesting. I hope there's something for everyone um, here today. Now, let me start out by removing all the bump here from my slides. That's the best. There we go. So now we can have a look at the image I wanted to start with, which is to make a point that I think is important when we think about photography. Photographs are much more than what they show or what they seem to show. We're looking here at a picture of a picture, a photo of a photo. Can you make that out? Anybody, yeah? For anybody under the age of 35 in the audience, this is, you're probably thinking that's weird, why didn't they just slap it on a scanner or a photocopier, right? But this was a standard practice um, until quite recently. If you needed to create a new negative to, to help circulate an image or make new prints of an image, you took a photo of a picture. Now the picture that's in the picture is the road leading to the Valley of the Kings. If you've ever been a tourist in Egypt, you'll probably have spotted that. It's quite a recognizable mountain peak in the backdrop there. And the Valley of the Kings is, of course, where the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in November 1922. And this photograph appears in the first book uh, that Howard Carter, the, the excavator, uh, ever published about the tomb. It was rushed into production um, within less than a year, in 1923. We, we can't publish anything academic in, in that kind of speed today. And so this book, this book included this photograph. Is it a photograph that he had taken? And is it a photograph from 1922 or 1923? Well, yes and no. The photograph that's in the picture, so the, the photograph that's being photographed, was actually taken in 1910, and then re-photographed probably in 1923, in order to make the picture that was needed for, for this book that was being rushed um, into print and that went on to become a bestseller. It was a matter of convenience. Um, Howard Carter needed a picture of the Valley of the Kings for his book to show roughly where the tomb was located, and he asked his colleague, a man named Harry Burton, to help out, and Burton provided one. It was Burton who had taken the original photograph not in 1922, but in 1910. And funnily enough, I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, it was Carter who, in his previous job, had been responsible for making this little wooden shelter there, which is where the donkeys and donkey drivers who carried tourists into the Valley of the Kings um, could rest in the shade while the crazy tourists went around and looked at royal tombs. I'm showing, I'm starting with this picture of the picture, as I said, to make an, a point, I think it's an important point, because it tells us that photographs aren't, or aren't just, about what they show. They're about relationships between people, and as they circulate between people, or appear in publications, or get filed away in drawers or photo albums, photographs take on different meanings and different roles. Archaeologists, and I'm one of them by training, are used to thinking about photographs for what they show, what the photograph is of. It's a photograph of the Valley of the Kings. But in this project, what I've been look doing is looking at the photographs as photographs and as a complete archive of photographs. Because asking questions about what kinds of photographs were taken, why, how, by whom, and how they were used, all of these are questions that can help us look at something as famous, as well known as the tomb of Tutankhamun in a different light. How many of our ideas about the tomb and about King Tut go back to the photographs taken at the time? How did photography play up or down 
the roles of different people who contributed to the excavation. And what happens when an excavation ends? Where do photographs wind up? And which photographs and photographers have been overlooked? To orient us um, in, in the context of the, of, the, of the tomb and its discovery, let's go back um, to that first season, November 1922, the discovery of the tomb. Um, the sealed entrance, it's an underground tomb, so reached down a flight of steps, and then, and then a sealed entrance, which was um, uncovered by um, <laughs> Carter's chief, chief foreman, Bayes, uh, in, in early November. Um, that was the kind of moment of discovery, then quickly backfilled to await the arrival of a man who was paying for the whole thing, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, um, who had to get out to Egypt from uh, Downton Abbey, Highclere, Highclere Castle. <laughs> right. So Carnarvon had, uh, for about 15 years, he'd been bankrolling um, Howard Carter to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. This was something that the Egyptian Antiquities Authorities had been encouraging because they themselves couldn't afford necessarily the kind of large-scale clearance work, so they occasionally would let a wealthy dilettante like Carnarvon pitch in, and then give him an experienced excavator like Howard Carter um, to, to do the work. Carter is the third man on the right here with the, the, the walking stick and the bow tie, and um, for, for, for most of the time, Carter had his team of experienced Egyptian workmen with a couple of uh, foremen he'd been working with for, for 20 years or so, in Egypt, and also would have been using, um, as needed, local labor, including boys and girls, we see here in the photograph um, from 1920, so earlier in the work. And this is the photograph probably taken by Carter, and later on it gets um, turned into a sort of narrative of, of the successful search for the tomb of Tutankhamun and that's how it's, it's currently archived. So a lot of hard work had been involved leading up to um, 1922. What that meant though, that when actually faced with this sealed tomb, and he and Carnarvon had an initial look um, into it, into the first room, leading up to it, sort of um, looking into that was sort of, oh gosh, what do we do now? Um, this, this was an unprecedented find, and so uh, Carter realized that he was going to need more help. He and the Earl of Carnarvon already had a very good relationship with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, if you've ever um, been to New York or, or from New York and have been there. So very, um, a, a rather, relatively new museum at that time, but a very well bankrolled museum. And Carter and Carnarvon had a good relationship with him because they'd actually been selling them antiquities for many years. So everybody was very friendly with each other. And when the museum, when the museum in New York um, got in touch to congratulate Carter, they offered, you know, can we do anything? Can we offer help? And Carter said, yes, could they lend Burton? So Burton's the third man on the left there, and of the plus fours, holding his little, gently holding his cigarette. Harry Burton was an Englishman, but like um, <coughs> another Englishman, Arthur Mace, we can make him out second from left, they were, they were employed by the Metropolitan Museum, so by the American institution they were employed to excavate in Egypt, basically the next valley over. Now all these men had known each other for, for years, for 10 or 20 years, so they were very friendly, and Carter, in asking for help, specified um, these two men, and especially Burton, because Burton was known, was considered to be about the best photographer who was working on Egyptian sites at the time. Photography in the 1920s, um, might seem a long time ago to us now, but it wasn't early photography by any means. The technology had been around since the 1830s, and it really took off around 1880, when pre-coated glass negatives hit the market. So photography by the 1920s was absolutely ubiquitous and had been for some time. This um, slide here I wanted to show you, it's a, it's a copy, it's a reproduction of a painting. Done in around 1890, um, we see at the left, we see the German Egyptologist, Emil Bruch, um, looking at his pocket watch because he's timing an exposure in the camera that's straddling, the tripod is straddling a coffin lid, and this is the sort of photography that Bruch actually did in the Antiquities Museum 
in Cairo or at Giza, as it was in 1990. Brooks is wearing um, a tabouche, he's wearing a fez, because he was an employee of the Egyptian government. Egypt at that time was part of the Ottoman Empire, and um, although at this time, from 1882, I'm going to go into a bit of history now, because I find when I speak to British audiences, they don't know the history, so um, bear with me. So from 1882, the strings of the Egyptian government had been pulled by Britain, and military troops were occupying Egypt, having invaded in the summer of 1882. So there was this um, veil of protectorate, as Lord Cromer called it, where Egypt technically is part of the Ottoman Empire and answers to Turkey, but in fact is effectively governed and is occupied by Britain. The, um, as an aside, Tahrir Square in central Cairo, which is where the Egyptian Museum is today, right next to that was a huge um, military barracks for the British troops right now, until the 1950s. So a bit of background, which is going to become important. The kind of camera that we see in this uh, painting, the production of the painting, isn't that dissimilar from the kind of camera, a view camera or a stand camera, that Burton would have used. Um, unfortunately, Burton's own cameras don't um, survive today. He occasionally, in, in his letters, mentions the cameras that he owned, but the, there's no uh, record of what happened to them afterwards. So you get a um, kind of square or rectangular body with the bellows that can expand, and the um, a tilt mechanism as well. So you could the lens on the front is interchangeable, you can have different lenses, and then you tilt or angle the camera back, if anyone's ever used a camera like this, which helps you with distortion. Um, and Britain uses that, for instance, to, to photograph things that are square, because otherwise you would have been going at funny angles. Excuse me, could you yes. use your mic? Sorry, is the mic okay? Okay, so I'm talking about so the, the, the camera mechanism, right, is, is um, roughly similar, right, on the tripod of, of the kind of camera that Burton would have used. Is that? Right. Thanks for letting me know. Um, by the 1920s, when Burton is photographing, there were film negatives available, so that's one difference in the technology. But like a lot of photograph uh, photographers um, who worked in archaeology, Burton didn't use film negatives. He preferred glass negatives, uh, large format, 18 by 24 centimeter, or seven by nine inch, if you prefer imperial, he was working with metric negatives. Um, so glass negatives that you could fit into a slide and, and expose for as long as you needed to and, and take out. Is that? I've actually got an example of a dark slide with me, which I'll, I'll, I'll get out afterwards if anybody wants to see what, what a negative holder at the time looked like. So, right, so that's just a, a bit of the technological, the technical background to the use of the kinds of cameras and the use of photography that we've been dealing with in, in Egypt in the 1920s. Now, the reason somebody like Harry Burton preferred to use large glass negatives um, is twofold, really. First, they offered the sharpest detail. And secondly, you could print them directly. You didn't need to enlarge them. So this is one of my photographs of one of Burton's photographs, a print from the 1920s in the archives of the Metropolitan Museum in New York as he printed it and mounted it in an album you know, about so big. So to give you a sense of that direct printing of a large negative and the, the kind of detail it let you see, it's a photograph, it's one of the first photographs taken in the first room, the so-called antechamber, of the tomb of Tutankhamun with alabaster vases lined up and stacked up against a wall of the tomb. And you can see the number cards in place. Can you make those out? 57, 60, 140, way in the back. And those were cards to number each object in sequence as it was found. And we'll see how those cards stay with the objects as work proceeds in the tomb. So it's a cataloging system that's imposed. Um, sorry, it's not a great photograph, partly because it's by me, and partly because the, the album sleeves are in plastic, so there's a bit of reflection there. Now, Burton also used um, a, a smaller negative, what's known as a half plate, so about 13 by 18 centimeters, 4 by 6, 5 by 7, that kind of thing. But again, would be, those would be printed directly, 
Um, so it's just it's a way to have another camera or to photograph smaller objects sometimes. And this is an example of some of those, again, in the albums in New York, where now three prints fit on the page. And these are all bits of um, chariot, chariots that were found disassembled in the first route of a tomb. So dozens of individual chariot parts get catalogued and photographed. We actually have a photograph of Burton <coughs> taking one of these photographs. So there he is in his postcards again. And he's working here, if you can make out, the camera is upside down. The camera is fixed in the stand so that it can photograph vertically instead of being on a tripod and photographing out, right? We're upside down. I'll come back to this setup later and talk about the, the reason for it and what kinds of photographs were produced. For now, I wanted to use this picture um, to follow up a couple of other points about about photography at the tomb of Tutankhamen. So first, where are we? This is not the tomb of Tutankhamen. This is a, a neighboring tomb, much larger, also much later, belonged to King Seti I. And the Egyptian antiquities um, authorities gave Carter this tomb to use as a place to, um, to store and to work on and conserve <coughs> the artifacts and to um, photograph them before they were created up and shipped to Cairo. Tellingly, it was known as the laboratory tomb, and I'll come back to that. Um, so this tomb is also, uh, where we'll see later, is where the unwrapping of the mummy takes place in 1925. And this is indeed where Burton did a lot of the photography of individual objects once they'd been repaired, because it let him have natural daylight instead of electric light. So he does a lot of, a lot of the photography using um, just the sunlight. Second point, in this photograph, how many people are there in the picture? Two. Thank you, yes, there are two. There's Burton, and there's an Egyptian man waiting um, to one side, possibly one of the Rais, um, the Rais, there were several, it's usually translated as for and to the senior, the senior experienced um, Egyptian excavators. I ask the question though because very often, and I've seen this happen quite recently as well, when photographs like this are reproduced in books or used on TV or in museum exhibitions, only the white guy gets identified and often the Egyptian guy isn't even mentioned. Now there's a, one reason I could say is well we don't know the names really, we don't have the way these photographs were published and recorded at the time no one made notes of names of the Egyptian workmen. We do know some of them. We know that the four senior guys, Ahmed Gergar, uh, Gad Hassan, Hussein Ahmed Saeed, and Hussein Abu Awad. Why don't we know their names as well as we know Harry Burton's or Howard Carter's? And why can't we identify them specifically with any of the photographs? That's a, that's a big gap in our knowledge. But to not even mention, as I've seen happen, that there is an Egyptian workman, archaeologist in the picture, is um, quite an oversight and quite telling. It wasn't only the inexperienced excavators who kept the excavation going. Um, there were also um, a team of local carpenters that we see here in a photograph probably taken by the Earl of Carnarvon himself. And so it's the men and boy on the right are part of this team of local carpenters all of whom, by the way, were Christians and still are in this part of Egypt. And then the man in the, the, the tope hat, the pith helmet, is a friend of Carter's who pitched in for a couple of years. He was a retired engineer named Arthur Callender. And I've actually just heard this, that his great nephew, possibly, and we have to check, he might be, might be working here for the Society of Antiquaries. <laughs> um, but, uh, Calendar had been in Egypt as an engineer for Egyptian state railways because it was the British who built the railways and um, ran the railways in Egypt at the time. Burton himself also had an Egyptian men who worked with him again for 20 years or more um, uh, as assistants, as kind of photographers' assistants. Mm. Uh, we only know the name of one of them, a guy named Hassan, um, who survived Burton, and uh, we know about him from. from letters of Burton's widow. 
afterwards during the Second World War. But uh, here's a picture of these three uh, PhD students there behind Burton. Burton there in his plus fours, um, outside, looking down outside the tomb. And in this instance, using a film camera, a moving picture camera, which is um, a story in itself. So all these Egyptian workers we have to think of as being part of the team seem at the time as second class and not named, but I think that's something that we now need to challenge in terms of how we think about who excavated the two of the home and who <coughs> took the photographs. Right. So if we move on, um, thinking about the, the photography, so Burton gets lent, as it were, by the Metropolitan Museum of Art to Carter to, to partake in this sort of find of the century. You know, it was already 1922, they were talking about that way. Um, this is the great discovery. And the photography was so important to the tomb, that to, to the work of, of clearing the tomb, that the schedule of work was actually adjusted to accommodate Burton, to accommodate what he need and needed in, in practical terms. And the, the, the times of day, which were best to shoot, all those kinds of things. There was huge public interest in the tomb, and this photograph gives you some idea of that because all the other people around there are not Burton, they're, they're tourists. So if you had already booked um, a tour to Egypt in the winter of 1922 to 1923, you really hit it lucky. And, and people are pressing in, they're looking down, they're at the road level in the Valley of the Kings, looking down at the tomb entrance and watching. Um, the work that's being done. So there's huge public interest, and that's one reason why Burton also takes publicity shots and tries to take some, some moving picture film, snippets of which are in the, uh, have been digitized and preserved in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He'd never used a film camera before, but um, he sort of had to, because one of the wealthy American patrons of the museum in New York bought the expedition a movie camera, so he just kind of had to get on with it. And there's lots of letters between him and the curator in New York saying, you know, the thing broke again, and I don't know how to develop the work, and the first footage is really disappointing. And actually, the, the same patron then paid for Burton and his wife to go to Hollywood in between the first and second season and, and get some training at the movie studio. No offense, preposterous, it's all a bit Donald Trump, really. Um, but it's all just sort of over the top. We're going to take him to Hollywood and we're going to show this, this, this nice English photographer from Lincolnshire how to make a movie about the tomb of Tutankhamun, which never actually happened <coughs> for reasons which will become clear. But again, I think as a kind of side element of the photography, the working photography that Burton is there to do, it tells us about the press interest, the public interest, and, and the, the ambitions of the people who are involved in this project. Publicity had been orchestrated from the start of the discovery by Lord Carnarvon, who signed a deal with the London Times, giving them exclusive access to news about the tomb, interviews with the workers, with the, with the staff, and with Burton's photographs. And um, this probably seemed like a good idea to Carnarvon at the time, because it would help defray his expenses um, and, and give them a mouthpiece, give them an official way to present the tomb. Um, but it immediately caused problems for two reasons. First of all, this is a, an image from uh, the Illustrated London News, uh, from sort of the other direction of the previous photo we saw, all those tourists looking down at the tomb are taking pictures themselves. So it was a struggle from the start to try to control the public presentation of the tomb and photographs of the tomb. All they could control, really, was what Burton did inside the tomb. The second reason this was a bad idea um, it was 1922, and Egypt had just won, um, or kind of called that one, its independence from Britain. There's a long, um, messy backdrop to that. There's a revolution in 1919, and the British then acted in 1922. They acted unilaterally to call Egyptian elections <coughs> while maintaining British control over the Suez Canal and Sudan. So it wasn't really what Egyptian politicians wanted, but it was better than nothing. So there's a, a newly elected national government in Egypt, and they take a great source of pride, um, as do you know, many of the Egyptian um, population and cultural figures, literary figures, newspapers in, in Egypt, 
they're, they're a messy crowd of this fight with Chiro Hellman, and the timing coming as it does, he becomes a symbol of the resurrection of the whole country. So for Egyptian papers to find themselves being told by a British lord that they have to talk to the London Times to get news about an Egyptian discovery didn't go over very well, as you can imagine. And these are the kinds of photographs that were the first that the Times had the first dibs on. So these are the first photographs that Burton took in the first chamber of the tomb um, before anything was disturbed and we were supposed to feel that this is just as it was um, you know, completely untouched. This is actually, um, gosh, about six weeks after the initial discovery. The tomb has since been rigged up for electric lighting, so this has made this photograph is only possible because there's electric lighting and the basket, the basket there is propped up just so to hide a hole, an ancient hole, which was perhaps helpfully made a bit larger so that Carter and Colonel Arben and a couple of other people could get through secretly and have a look at what lay beyond. So this photograph is, well, not what it seems, but this is the kind of photograph that Carnarvon and Carter could control. Burton's the only person who takes the photographs inside, um, and, and there we have it. And that's what makes the, the real impact in the press is when these, these are first published in January. They finally appear, I think, in early January of 1923. And I'll just show you the back of that same. So that's an actual print. Um, I guess Burton was printing them and giving them to the Times contact and they're posted to London, so there's always a couple of weeks delay by the time they appear in the press. And the back of the photograph, you know, these things as objects really matter. The back is covered with copyright stamps and credit lines and not to be published before such and such a date. It's all about you know, what we call PR today. So why was there so much press and public interest in the tomb of Tutankhamun? Um, we tend to take it for granted that ancient Egypt is interesting. We're probably all here today because we think ancient Egypt is interesting. Um, I actually don't think anything is necessarily interesting. I think it's always worth asking, why then? Why there? So I mentioned earlier that political background, right, of the British occupation and the revolution of 1919, which Burton had actually witnessed. He was doing war work in, in Cairo at the time for the British passport office. And then it was only really 1920, so less than two years before the discovery, that tourists had started to go back to Egypt. Thomas Cook, I think, only started its tours again in 1920. So there'd been a few years when Egypt was just a place of bad news. So I think the discovery of Tutankhamun in 1922 gives the British and the Egyptian press something positive to cover and something to claim for different purposes. Here's another um, spread from the Illustrated London News, which was a sort of sister, had a sister paper of the time, so they had a reciprocal arrangement to use Burton's photographs. So the discovery of an intact tomb in the Valley of the King was, was big news. Yes, it was a rare and astonishing find. Um, but the tomb and the photographs of the tomb became the arena for a conflict that developed and was played out between Carter and the Egyptian antiquities authorities, who for the first time were answering to the Egyptian government. Now I should explain, there's not a simple kind of nationalistic you know, alliance here. The Egyptian antiquities authorities, it, it, it actually was run by a Frenchman, and many of the, the league employees were British. So it's not that there's a simple us and them framework, but there's a context there about what's going to be appropriate in an independent Egypt that you can't have earls and, and Howard Carter running around doing what they like anymore and flouting, um, flouting conventions. Um, basically, the conflict was about who would own the fines from the tomb and who had the right to speak for the tomb, to speak for ancient Egypt. Carter, Carnarvon, and the Metropolitan Museum staff clearly felt that it was their right and they also felt they had a right to receive some of the fines from the tomb, um, even though their contract, if you leave it, 
and the way I would read it means that that wasn't you know, it was such a rare find that those finds you know, should stay in Egypt and nothing legally should have left the country. Um, but it's considered up for a debate. I mean, that's why the Metropolitan Museum was so willing to help out. Yes, sure, take Gurtin, that's fine. We can spare him for a few weeks a year. They were hoping to get a cut of the funds. And I think we can then see how the photographs become part of this, this official narrative, this discourse of how the tomb is presented in the press. So this is a, a good spread for that from November 1923, the peak of interest, and the archaeologists white guys, right, are spoken of as men of science, men who use the utmost care and delicacy to remove objects from the tomb and carry them to the laboratory, which is the picture that you see right up there. That's the, the laboratory tomb. That's the, what's so telling about that word. This is a scientific endeavor, and you can't argue with science, can you? And then we see there's Alan Mace and Alfred Lucas, the um, Egyptian government chemist working on the tombs, these nicely kind of almost mirror photographs of them placed across the, the gutter of the newspaper, doing terribly delicate and important things to objects. Yes, the objects did require cleaning, repair, um, consolidation usually with wax because they were so fragile, um, but this is really about presenting the work of British experts as science and science is something that only white men do. Um, only they have the authority over the fragile remains of Egypt's past. Let's compare that to a reconstruction done by a British artist, but not published in the time. So this was something that circulated separately and then gets picked up, I found it, in an Egyptian um, monthly magazine, the Crescent Al Hilal, where um, we see Egyptian workmen only doing the work the very delicate, fragile work of dismantling the shrines in the, the burial chamber. These are these massive gilded wooden shrines that sur surrounded the sarcophagus and the coffins. And so I think it's interesting, perhaps, that an Egyptian publication picked up on this illustration as a way to show, um, well, yeah, who is doing the work of archaeology? Now, dismantling the shrines was a logistical nightmare, and we do have Burton's photographs, which show that you couldn't actually have got that many guys into the space. It was a very confined space, and it was a space of collective effort. So here we have two of the foreman, Carter there, so with his hair, you know, as he's um, comparing notes, discussing what to do next, and Arthur Callender, the man that we saw earlier in the fifth helmet. Here, sort of very delicately, they had to take the shrines apart in order to get them out in that. Um, confined space. You can see there's very little clearance to the ceiling. So these photographs then tell us a slightly different story, and could be, we could read them in different ways. Again, about who's doing the work, what's the nature of the work, why take a photograph of it in the first place, and how. So Burton's had to, you know, bounce electric light off the ceiling here from a lamp, so again electric light, and then a reflector in the back as well to, to help get this. And again, I think you could think, right, these photographs are, um, they're showing, well, they're, they're partly a, a just in case, I think, just in case it all goes wrong, and we've got photographs of these shrines, in case we drop a bit. Um, but really, they're also about showing that kind of care and the, the nature of the work, the strain, the effort. It's, it's heroic in a way, it's sort of making Carter and Callender, that would be the narrative these would be used in the British press. They're the heroes, but we can then look at them again in another way and catch up who's doing the work and how are they doing it together. Two months after this photograph was taken, this is the second season, so two months later, February 1924, Carter downed tools in what he called a strike. He claimed that the Egyptian authorities were interfering with the work. And so work on the tomb stopped for a year, they locked him out of it, um, and it only resumed in 1925 when a uh, more pro-British Egyptian government um, had been put in place with support by the British. So it picks up in 1925. Burton no longer takes those kinds of shots. We don't get the, the heroized name kind of work in progress in the tomb. The mood has changed. There's also no longer the contract with the time, so there's no longer an incentive to take photographs like that 
showing work being done and, and help them to construct these narratives. We do still get sort of photographs, as Burton takes this, um, of all the people who had gathered for the, the start of the unwrapping of the royal mummy. It's a momentous occasion, so it's something to commemorate, but it's a very different kind of photograph. Here we've got Har Mun, the Egyptian antiquities officials, one of the most one of the oldest guys here, Carl from the left, Mohammed Shaban, who'd tried to train as an Egyptologist in the 1870s in Cairo and then completely shut out. So here's a moment, here's a very different moment. And then there's Carter looking a little bit chastened, maybe a little bit nervous as well, because they're about to unwrap the mummy. And the man next to him here, that call, is the Frenchman who actually fell into the service and had tried to keep the whole thing going. So photographs tell complicated stories um, when you start digging around. The next few minutes, the last few minutes here, I wanted to look in more detail at the kind of photographs, the kinds of photographs that Burton took. And we could start um, with the mummy unwrapping itself. So they're quite, I think, again, if you just think, oh, it's a photograph of such and such, it's quite a limited view. I mean, on the, um, the Griffith Institute, um, at Oxford University, they're the beholders of Howard Carter's archives, so they've got about half of the photographs, the negatives of, of Burton's material. And the way they've, um, that you can search for these online, you can really only search by, well, what object is it? So yes, we could think, okay, it is X, it is the mummy, and search by that. But the photographs are actually quite different, and they're doing different things. So this is a photograph. Looking down, you can see the tripod legs. So as much as possible in the burial chamber, which wasn't very big, if you remember how close the shrines were to the, to the ceiling. Um, so as, about as high as he can get with his camera to get a view of the mummy in its coffin. It's inside two coffins there because they're stuck together with resin. Um, so with the lids off and before it's moved out of the burial chamber, it has to be carried over to the laboratory for the unwrapping. So this again is a kind of insurance shot just in case something terrible goes wrong. Um, but also a bit of a, you know, this is the, the condition as soon as we got the lid off, you know, as soon as we sort of started looking at it. It's a bit rough and ready, you know, you can see the, the cardboard boxes and, and brushes, tools lying around. It's not a, a pretty, pretty shot. It's not something they would have been thinking of publishing, for instance. A bit of a contrast then, when it gets over to the laboratory too, and prepared for the unwrapping, which is really a, more of a chiseling than an unwrapping, and cleaned up, isn't it? So nice, clear space around, and a sheet draped around the coffin, so it's being presented in a much more orderly fashion. So again, a bit, you know, different kind of photograph. And then photographs, like they did in the rooms of the tombs, so photographs moving through the, the body as layers are removed and objects are removed. The pre-printed cards, like we saw on the bases, are put here on bits of, bits of jewellery and amulets that are taken off of the body. When they get to the point of, um, on the last day, um, decapitating the body, they take the head off in order to remove the gold mask, and then they want to take photographs of the head and study the head. So I think Burton had, at this point, he did have publication in mind. He takes two photographs of the head lying on this nice, clean square of cloth, and those are published, cropped, you know, so that you only see the white background. What that cloth is doing, you know, from photographs of the work in progress, is hiding the scissors and the scalpels and the flakes of linen and text, you know, textiles and resin and skin that have come off of it. So those, I think, are taken thinking, yeah, we'll, we might publish these, they'll look nice. Um, but he takes other shots, which I think weren't meant for publication at all, where the head is cropped up, it's actually the handle of a paintbrush on a rough wooden board. And these photographs are taken full face, taken from the back, and taken left and right profile, which is a very well-established, very long-running, almost a century of history behind this visual trope of studying, measuring skulls, studying skulls, depicting skulls and heads as part of race science. So there's um, a way in which photography um, replicates um, and engages with earlier forms of visualizing the ancient past. In contrast to the 
you know, say 10 or, 10 or so shots he takes of the head, he takes almost 20 shots of the gold mummy mask and regrets afterwards that he didn't take more, that he didn't have more time. They were quite pressed for time to get the gold mask and the solid gold coffin um, repaired and conserved and shipped to Cairo for security. So he takes views from pretty much every angle that he can get of the gold mummy mask without its beard, obviously, the beard is not attached. Um, if you remember that ridiculous news story from last year. I wanted to um, then talk about the background that he's using. He's devised quite a clever backdrop. Um, we didn't have it in the first season, but from the second season onwards, you can see it better in this photograph. He uses a round, sort of a round table with a round cloth covered board and then a stiff paper <coughs> backdrop that goes halfway around it. And again, remember he was doing this in the daylight. So once the objects have been conserved, cleaned, repaired, he's got them up there in the laboratory tomb. He can use that sheltered daylight area at the mouth of the tomb to bounce with his assistance, bounce sunlight onto them and take as much of an exposure as he needs. And that backdrop then helps minimize the shadows and, and give some good light to, to bounce off of. And then if you look at the bottom, the little number has stayed with the object. So we can get, from one object, we can get several photographs at different stages um, and sometimes a couple of different, different angles. So sometimes he plays around when he tries a different angle or different lighting, different focus. Um, usually he gets the shot that he wants, um, but he does tend to take two negatives, two photographs of each object. And that's for a reason, which I'll come back to right at the end. That's because he's given two negatives to Carter, and Carter then divides those roughly half and half, um, keeps about half of them for himself, and gives half of them to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So I'll come back to that. So here we get this little gold statue of a snake, one of the mini statues from the tomb, which all of which are found wrapped up in linen and kept in shrines. So we again get kind of work in progress shots, this interim stage of, of discoveries of the objects. Um, we're kind of going backwards here now. We saw the, the glamorous view, and now we see this interim view looking down into the shrine where the objects are still wrapped up in linen. That's what Egyptian art statues like this, that's what they were for. They were to be seen. They were sacred objects to be wrapped up and kept out of sight. And then the same day, so earlier in the day, we go backwards in time again, a shot of the same shrine in place of these staged shots of removing objects from the tomb. Um, and sometimes Burton will take two versions of that. He'll take one like this one before the little number cards are in place, but then he'll take another one with the little number cards in place. So more of a kind of working photograph to help the archaeologist track the object through its different lives, through its stages of work that are going to turn it from an ancient Egyptian object, whatever it was doing in ancient Egypt, and turn it into something that archaeologists can use um, and stick in a museum. And I think these photographs are, you know, they're quite, again, you can read them in different ways or think about them in different ways. One thing that um, they're doing, yes, is that practical task of helping keep track of objects as archaeologists remove them. Archaeology is a destructive process in that way. It's about undoing all the things that have been done in the ancient past. Um, but then these photographs, I think, also convince us quite successfully, too successfully perhaps, that we're seeing with ancient Egyptian eyes. We're not. We're seeing with Burton's camera lens, and it's not the same thing. Here we are again, as I started Burton at that vertical style, and I promised to explain just a little <coughs> bit more about, um, about the setup. So the camera's looking straight down at a piece of brown glass, frosted glass, we would say today, and that's what the object is on, that bit of chariot um, there. And then there's a, a white or light colored piece of card underneath it. And I've got another photograph that the same setup, you know, when he printed this. He would have cropped it or, or even cropped it further down by object. But you can see the frame there and the, the, the pale surface, surface below. The object number is just so. And this is um, to reduce shadows. There's still shadows here, but photographing things with the bracelets 
the results still in place and the answer the money. But they're very different here when they're isolated and they're pristine and organized with their cards on this glass background. So the, the whole point is to isolate the object and make it look like it's just against this kind of clear, pristine space that it's, again, it's, a, it's an object for study or an object that you could put in a museum. Not every photograph that Burton took was a success. He himself was anxious about whether he'd done the right thing sometimes. Um, and not every object from the tomb was as carefully catalogued and, and recorded and preserved as we're supposed to think. I mean, this was a long project, 10 years it took from start to finish, and done under very difficult conditions sometimes in every way. Um, by the time Burton actually took his last 20 photos, which was around New Year's 1933, he took his last photos for Carter in the tomb and he wrote to his boss at the Metropolitan Museum that he was thrilled to be done and he, and he was fed up with the work and with, with Howard Carter. So, isolation, um, like this bed against this clean, pale background here, printed and mounted against another pale background of the photo album. Isolation, that's certainly what many of the photographs that our just produce seem to be about, as if the more clear, uncluttered, and depopulated the images, the closer it can get us to the real thing, to ancient Egypt. But as I said at the start of my talk today, when we look at photographs as photographs, we see that they aren't about isolation at all, but about connections between times, places, ideas, and most of all, between people. So I mentioned with the snake statue that uh, Burton tried to take two exposures um, each time, two near identical negatives, so that Carter could keep one and the other could go to the Metropolitan Museum, Burton's employer. By 1928, about halfway through the project, it was clear that no objects from the tomb of Tutankhamun were going to leave Egypt legally. Instead, Carter negotiated for the Egyptian government to repay the Dowager Countess of Carnarvon for the expenses the family had incurred, um, around £30,000 at the time. Um, just to make that clear, as I read it, the Egyptian government paid for something legally and morally it already owned. Um, Carter also put some of his own money into the work, and he calculated that the Metropolitan's contribution in kind through Burton's labour and, and Mesa's labour had been worth about £8,000, but the Metropolitan never pursued this with Carter or with the Egyptian authorities, and just kept the, um, the negatives and the albums. So Burton's negatives live parallel lives between a Manhattan cold store and an Oxford archive room. Um, what that allows us to do, I mean, there's more than, as I mentioned, there's more than 3,000 of them, um, although you usually, because of this dual reality, you usually see people saying well, there's 1,400 or 1,500, there's, there's actually many more. Um, what this allows us to do is to compare, in some cases, which negative did Burton actually print and how did he print it. So this bed is a good example of that. He printed the negative that the Metropolitan Museum owned, um, and this is the, the print in their albums, and he's cropped it in close to the bed. He's even cropped out the little number that if we look at Oxford's negative, we can see is out to the side. Oxford's negative also shows us that what he cropped out are the two Egyptian youths, assistants in the background, holding up the backdrop um, behind the bed. Who speaks for ancient Egypt? Who really takes its photographs? And who is too easily cropped out or overlooked? I hope um, in this talk today I've covered a lot of material, a lot of different points. We can see that the camera tells us a lot, or can tell us a lot about King Tutankhamun, about his tomb, about ancient Egypt. That's all quite true. But when we look at photographs for what they are, not just what they show, we see something surely just as important. We see our world and its recent histories, some of which are more visible than others. Thank you.